not going to be that good. So uh, listen carefully, take very good notes, because Mark's going to tell us a whole bunch of things. Go ahead, Mark. Welcome. All right. Hi there, guys. I'm going to see if I can share my screen here. I've got a lot of slides, a lot of graphics. 27, 8 by 10, combo glossy pictures with the circles and the arrows and paragraph on the back. And yes, everyone, right, uh, Mark, I'm going to do a, I'm going to do a group mute. So prepare to unmute your microphone. Okay, Mark, you can unmute. Lower left. There you go. All right. Give me a moment here. All right. Is my screen shared properly? Yes. Looks great. All right. We're going to talk about DC power distribution. Um, I'm going to cover uh, just some of the basic things. We, we have a lot of DC power products. We're going to cover some of them in this presentation. Then I'm going to cover a lot of the common things that people are calling in about, asking about, and having trouble with. Uh, a lot of discussion about batteries and battery types and what to go out and buy and how long they're going to last and that kind of a thing. And a little bit about solar power as well. I just want to start with some of the basic uh, issues that we're up against here. On that top diagram, I'm showing a 50-foot cable with a six-watt light, light bulb, and I'm going to lose about 1% of my energy in that cable. But if I increase that to a 60-watt spotlight on the lower diagram, I lose 7% of my energy. And this is the problem that we're dealing with in amateur radio, because when you start transmitting at 100 watts or 1,500 watts, that cable loss makes a big difference. Here's an actual uh, description of the different size cables. In the above diagram, I had a 12 gauge cable for that 7% loss. If it were eight gauge cable, the loss would only be 3%. If it was 22 gauge cable, 67%. I'm losing more energy in the cable than I am uh, going to the transceiver. That energy goes into heat. When the heat is stretched out along the entire cable, it's not so bad, but uh, we're going to talk about connectors and switches where you have a similar problem. That diagram that I just showed you, that table, you can get that on our website by going to calculators, find cable size, and then enter in the length the cable run and the current draw that you expect. And it will give you a table like I showed you earlier. When it's got a red line on that, that means that the insulation is likely to be uh, uh, melting off the cable. The connectors, I want to start in the uh, lower uh, right corner there. A lot of you recognize that as an FM radio connector. What they've done here is they've actually split each of the conductors into three poles. So you've got uh, three conductors for the plus, three conductors for the minus. And by doing that, they're able to split the current between those and actually get more of a uh, uh, more current through the same connector. You know, like a, a form, huh? I'm going to check back. We're uh, check transmitting at 40 here. amps. That FM connector there I, will I dissipate about that. 4 I watts of energy. It, so. And the reason that I'm start, starting to talk about watts is because you can kind of translate watts into heat. You know, a 60 watt light bulb, you kind of have an idea of how hot that is. The connector above it, the uh, concentric DC power uh, jack, it's using a lot of uh, DC electronics, uh, consumer electronics. At 40 amps, that thing's going to be 48 watts. That's going to melt the connector very quickly. So five amps, it's less than a watt. It's probably going to handle that, but that's pretty much at the limit of what that kind of a connector can handle. In the opposite corner, the banana jack, um, 40 amps, 16 watts of energy. That's going to melt that connector as well. Uh, so the banana jack's not a good uh, choice for a lot of current. Um, in the upper left, that's the connector that we recommend here at West Mountain Radio. It's the power pole connector from Anderson. Um, 40 amps, we still have less than one watt of uh, energy lost in the connector. And the reason is because of the low uh, resistance of the contacts, 0 
all those on-house contacts. A few words about the power pole connectors. The 15 amp, 30 amp, and 45 amp uh, connectors are interchangeable. Um, the, <clears throat> the difference is how much metal is in there and what the size is the, of wire that you can put into there. But uh, you can plug a 15 amp into a 45 amp. They're genderless. You don't have a male and a female connector like you do with a lot of connectors. Um, they're impossible to plug in backwards. You can't get the plus to the minus or the minus to the plus as long as you've wired the cable up correctly. And uh, we recommend, uh, strongly recommend crimping them. It's more effective, uh, much lower resistance than you're going to get from soldering them. They are UV safe, meaning you can leave them out in the sun. They're not going to deteriorate, but they are not waterproof. We have a similar problem with switches. Um, again, the resistance in the switch is going to turn into heat and melt it. Be very careful when you're buying a switch that you buy a switch that's going to cover the current that you're going to be drawing. It's hard to find switches that are above three amps. They're out there. That uh, one on the uh, right side there is like from a charging station for a uh, electric vehicle. If, if you have a problem in your station, it's really easy to find a bad contact, a dirty contact by measuring voltage drops, either across the contacts or across the wires. Um, if you have a half a volt drop while you're transmitting, that probably means you're losing 10 watts in that, that connection right there. Uh, so that it's, it's very easy to find. You want to make sure you do this while you're transmitting and just go around the station with the, uh, with the meter and find out what your voltage drops are and that will easily identify problem areas. Uh, another common problem that we have, <clears throat> I've got a situation here where somebody put a weather station up on their uh, antenna mast. That weather station has like a telephone cable that comes down to a control unit and then that unit plugs into the wall. We also have the uh, base station uh, with a coax that goes up that same mast to the antenna itself. And that base station goes to a power supply, which also plugs into the same wall outlet. On the right side there, I'm showing the, the path that the ground is taken. The green loop there is showing the path that we intend from the ground going from the power supply to the transceiver. But you've got a second path going from the power supply to the wall outlet to the other wall outlet up to the weather station, all the way up the mast of the weather station that's clamped onto the mast then up to the coax, down to the radio. So there's actually two paths for the ground. The problem here is when you transmit at 20 amps, it's gonna try and split that 20 amps between those two paths. And that uh, telephone cable is not gonna handle it, it's just gonna vaporize. So you have to be, think very carefully about the grounding and, and what, the, what the current paths are gonna be. In a vehicle, it's very tempting for a lot of people to use the chassis itself as a uh, ground. It's a really nice conductor. It's all over the place. It's easy to connect to. So in this case, we've got an amplifier in the trunk. You're connecting the ground to uh, some, some place in the trunk where you can grab it. The battery always goes to ground. The problem with that is you're sharing a conductor with uh, the uh, spark plug, the radio, the computer in the vehicle, and the noise from those items are going to be superimposed on the same path going to the amplifier. So that noise is going to end up at the amplifier. So it's really best to run a second ground all the way back, all the way to the battery. Let's talk about batteries. Um, <clears throat> this is a Rugani chart. It's used to uh, indicate weight versus energy. The uh, vertical uh, chart is showing here the instantaneous power. If you could think about, about that as cold cranking amps that they advertise a lot. The horizontal is showing you the capacity of the battery. Both of those numbers are divided by the weight of the battery because the people who make batteries are always thinking about weight and size. The purple line is a super capacitor. The darker blue line is what a lead acid battery typically comes in at. The yellow line is a lithium. And that green line over there is gasoline. Again, the battery people like to compare themselves to gasoline a lot. Lead acid batteries, always fuse it, best to fuse it near the battery. The fuse can be oversized 
you know, if you're expecting to transmit 30 amps and you have a 50 amp fuse or a 100 amp fuse, that's fine. All you're trying to do is prevent a short down the line, an accidental short, a screwdriver gets to where it doesn't need to get uh, from actually blowing the battery up. Uh, we recommend sealed batteries. There's nothing wrong with a wet battery, except that you're usually nearby the battery and the chance of spilling the acid is great, especially since you're transporting it and stuff. So an amateur radio use a sealed battery, if you can use it, is probably gonna be much safer. Uh, don't keep them in airtight enclosures. It's okay to have them inside. They vent a little bit of gas, um, but if you have it in a sealed container over time, that gas is gonna concentrate. Um, and dispose at uh, places like Battery Plus, you can uh, just get rid of those batteries. This is the uh, battery type I told you not to use, the flooded one. I just wanna start by going through how some of these batteries are manufactured so you have an idea of what you're buying when you go into the store. The flooded battery, it's essentially you have some plates in there, positive negative plates that are connected together and it's flooded with the acid. They just pour the acid in there. Uh, the acid of course evaporates so you have to replace it which is another problem uh, maintenance wise with the, uh, the wet cells. This is the, uh, the sealed uh, lead acid uh, version, uh, sometimes called gels. What they've done is they've replaced the acid that you pour in there with these little patties that, that squeeze between the plates. And those patties are infused with acid. So you're getting the same acid. It's just a cleaner, it's easier to manufacture. And it's, uh, you don't have to deal with the uh, evaporation that you do with the regular uh, flooded cell. This is a illustration of a starter battery for like an automobile. The big difference is they've increased the surface area on the plates. Um, they used to just drill holes in the plates to get more surface area. Um, then they kind of moved to a, a scheme where you have like a steel wool in there. Now they put sort of a steel wool paste in these little um, trays. Uh, what the, the goal is to get as much surface area as possible. What they figured out is that with more surface area, you get more of those cold cranking amps, the instantaneous um, current uh, out of the battery. The problem with the, uh, the starter battery is with all of that additional surface area, there's a really high probability of corrosion. The batteries corrode when they're not fully charged. A car battery spends almost all of its life fully charged. When you run it down, it charges right up again. Um, in amateur radio, use, it's a little bit different because you may run it down and then not start charging it for another 24 hours or something like that until you get home and you, know, you plug it in again. Um, <clears throat> while that, that time that it's not charged, this additional surface area increases the corrosion dramatically. So these batteries will not last very long with the way that we're gonna be using them. So stay away from batteries that are starter batteries. If they're really advertising the cold cranking amps on the battery, that probably means it's not a battery that's good for you. You wanna look for something that's uh, deep, uh, deep discharge kind of a thing, the kind of a battery that you would use in a trolling motor on a boat. Uh, so marine batteries are oftentimes uh, a good pick. This is a depth of discharge chart. Um, what this shows you, uh, let's look at the 50% line, for example. If I discharge the battery to 50%, charge it back up again. Discharge it 50%, charge it back up again. I'm gonna get about 1200 cycles out of that battery. Um, on the other hand, if I only go down to 10% and back up again, 10% and go back up again, I'm gonna get over 6,000 cycles on the battery. So this is showing you how many cycles you can get on the battery versus how far you deplete it. Now, lead acid battery, we don't recommend you go below 80%, so that's why the chart stops there. I'm going to talk about another technology of lead acid battery called the AGM battery. Um, the AGM batteries, what they've done is instead of those patties between the plates, they slip these envelopes over the plates. They're fiberglass envelopes with uh, acid infused in the fiberglass. And uh, it's a much cheaper battery to produce, and it's a lighter weight battery. Um, so there are some some positives to the AGM battery. However, I'm gonna look at that depth of discharge chart again. That's the orange line for the AGM battery and that same blue line we had earlier for the uh, standard sealed lead acid battery. Both the AGM and the sealed lead acid batteries are actually sealed. Um, <clears throat> in this case, if I go down to 50% back up again, 50% back up again, I'm getting about 200 actually less cycles on that battery before that AGM has hit end of life. The AGM batteries don't like to be discharged. If you're using it uh, for a base station, 
for backup when you lose your AC and you lose your AC a few times a month, I'm sorry, a few times a year, <clears throat> not a big deal. But this isn't the kind of battery that you want to take out into the field every weekend. This is a, uh, the red line here showing a discharge curve on a lead acid battery. This is the, as you use it, this is how the curve goes down. The green line is where the battery manufacturers recommend the batteries are rated at 10.5 volts. That's as far down as you should go. However, realistically, uh, most radios won't transmit below 11.7 volts. So that's the blue line. <clears throat> so I'm only getting 66% of my energy out of the battery. This is a lead acid battery um, at the point in time when you have to stop using it for transmit. You can still use it for receive down to 10.5 volts if you want, but if you're actually transmitting, you're only going to get 66% of the energy out of that battery. It gets even worse if you take into account resistance and cables and connectors and stuff like that. That's the yellow line, typical losses in the station. So in that case, I'm only getting 39% of the energy out of my battery before I have to stop using it. This chart here is a similar chart to what I just showed you. But what I've done is I've done a 30 second transmit, a 30 second receive, 30 second transmit, 30 second receive. Every time I transmit, the voltage drops. So you can see on that yellow line, when I've hit the 12% uh, usage, I've suddenly now don't have enough energy in my radio to transmit anymore. Um, if you're going to the blue line, if you've got a re really good station, you're still only getting a third of the energy out of that battery before you have 11.7 volts at the transceiver. And talk about lithium batteries. Now, the first thing is, when people hear about lithium batteries, they think about starting on fire. Uh, ever since the uh, cell phones started using lithium batteries, people talk about, hey, the phone suddenly gets really hot in my pocket. I had to pull it out and throw it in the wastebasket. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, the hover boards that are, you know, starting on fire. You hear about this all the time. What the manufacturers are saying, about one out of every 100,000 cells will have a tendency to have a thermal event. Um, what happens after the thermal event depends on the materials that it was made as to whether it explodes, whether it starts on fire, or whether it just gets hot. Um, and they say that works out to roughly one out of every 200,000 phones, roughly one out of every 100,000, I'm sorry, one out of 1,000 vehicles um, are going to have some sort of an event. <clears throat> the best I can tell, they don't seem to be trying to solve that problem anymore. Five years ago, everybody was trying to study it and figure out why this happens. Um, the interest is, is, seems to have dwindled off because the consumer market seems to be accepting it. The battery manufacturers will want to, you to know that when gasoline engines came out for vehicles, everybody was saying that's so dangerous, nobody should ever get into a vehicle. Gas, having a tank of gasoline next to your kids is a really bad idea. And in fact, even today, one out of every 1,300 cars has some sort of a vehicle fire. They're saying that the lithium batteries are actually a little bit better. So anyway, I'm just throwing that out there. That's what the battery manufacturers want you to know. There are tons of chemistries for lithium batteries. Um, <clears throat> there's like a new one every six months. The best for amateur radio use is the iron phosphate flavor. Uh, and now you're starting to see some iron phosphates with some magnesium in there as well. Um, they seem to be very good for high loads, like, you know, keying down your transmitter with 20 amps. Um, they've got a good, really good life span. And they're considered safer. And when you talk safer, it's like what happens when you pound a nail into it? You know, are you going to for sure die or are you just going to have to run? Um, so the, the I'm not going to go through all the technologies and what the differences are. I'm just going to tell you, try to look for the phosphate and the, uh, the iron in the batteries that you're looking for for amateur radio. Depth of discharge chart again. I've got the same AGM and lead acid lines on there, the orange and the blue, and the green line is lithium. That 50% discharge we were talking about earlier, 6,000 cycles I'm gonna get out of that lithium battery before it hits end of life. Um, so this is one big advantage to the lithium batteries. One of the disadvantages is temperature. <clears throat> that lead acid battery, will work 
at just about any temperature there is. And in fact, you're going to get more energy out of it um, at a higher temperature. And it's just as happy as it can be. The lithium battery, once you start using it above 80 degrees, its life will start to diminish. And if you try and use it below 32 degrees, um, it may actually be damaged or have one of those thermal events. So there's really a sweet spot where you're supposed to be using that battery. And you now it's going to be from 32 to 80. Uh, so that's something you have to be aware of, especially depending on the environment that you're using this radio set. This is that uh, discharge curve. I started out with the 30 uh, second receive, 30 second transmit. <clears throat> if you remember the previous one, it came down pretty quick. This battery drops, this is a lithium battery, it drops much more slowly in voltage. So by the time I hit the yellow line, I've still only depleted 76% of the energy in the battery. Um, so, I'm sorry, I've, I still have remaining, uh, so I think, I'm sorry, I've used 76% of the battery. So I'm getting way more bang for the amp hour out of the lithium battery. So when you're comparing apples to apples, um, a lithium battery with half the amp hours will probably last about the same amount as a lead acid battery does when you're talking about transmit time. I need to have a couple of slides here just talking about the way batteries charge. This is the charging algorithm for a lead acid battery. Basically, you supply a constant current for a period of time, then a constant voltage for a period of time. When the current drops below a certain amount, you then apply a maintenance charge basically forever. The maintenance charge in the lead acid batteries prevent it from corroding. Remember, we talked about the fully charged battery uh, reduces corrosion. So in the lead acid batteries, it's really best to just always apply that 13.8 volts just to keep the battery uh, tip top because the battery will have it has internal resistance and it'll slowly discharge on itself on its own. By keeping that 13.8 volts there, you really reduce the chance of corrosion. This is the way a typical uh, lead acid battery charger works. The lithium battery charger is very similar, constant current, constant voltage. However, instead of that uh, trickle charge at the end, you completely shut off the current. The problem with the lithium batteries is they will keep keep taking a small amount of current and that will get converted to heat. And it, it doesn't do the battery any good and it'll eventually do it harm. It'll eventually overheat. This is why you don't want to use a lead acid battery charger on a lithium battery. There are some lithium batteries that have electronics in them that will convert the lead acid charging algorithm to a lithium algorithm. But uh, for the most part, you have to make very sure that, that your lithium battery is going to tolerate a lead acid charger if you're going to try to do that. Here's a comparison of prices. Um, if all I'm using the battery for is received um, on the uh, far left there, the dollars per amp hour, uh, you're way better off um, on a lead acid battery. Right? It's gonna be cheaper on the lead acid battery for receive only. However, if you spend 50% of your time talking, they be on the far right there, the prices become very close. Yeah, the lead acid is still a little cheaper, but uh, remember you're gonna get uh, more life out of it and more less uh, maintenance hassle out of it. We've got a chart on our website again, go on our calculators, battery capacity calculator. This is a little bit hard to follow, but let me see if I can do it. If I spend 70% of my time talking and I'm doing the CW, you follow that orange line up, then I can go over, and if I'm using a 79 amp hour lead acid battery, I'm gonna get typically about six hours of use out of that battery. Uh, this chart can be set up to do all sorts of different kinds of batteries. So if you wanna spend some time figuring out what battery you wanna use, how long it's gonna last, depending on how you use the battery, uh, this chart could be very helpful. Uh, one more chart on the lithium batteries. Uh, lithium batteries are way lighter. Um, so you're getting like uh, six amp hours per pound out of a lithium battery, whereas it's just a little over like maybe one and a half amp hours per pound on a uh, lead acid battery. Uh, talk about battery boosting. Uh, West Mountain Radio just came out with a battery booster. Um, in the upper uh, left there, I've got the typical discharge chart. That's that red line you were looking at earlier on how lead acid battery discharges. If you run that through a booster, 
that actually will make sure that the voltage maintains uh, whatever you want, 13.8 volts, 14 volts, 14.5 volts, regardless of the input voltage from the battery. And that, of course, uh, will only last until the battery gets down to whatever you set it to, 10.5 volts, and then it just shuts off. But essentially, you're getting a lot more uh, talk time out of the radio. This is one way to get around that discharge problem that we have with the batteries. Um, looking at the cost, uh, taking that into consideration, 74 amp hour battery, $300, 10 hours of transmit time. That's about the same as a 40 amp hour uh, LiPo ad battery. Um, that'll be about $60 more and you get your save, same 10 hours of transmit time. If you use a, the lead acid battery with a booster, you spend that $300, $250 for the booster, and you're getting 15 hours of talk time out of that, that battery. And in order to get the same equivalent with a lithium battery, you'd need a 60 amp hour battery, and that would cost you around 570. And don't forget that that 250 that you spend um, on the second from last line, you get to reuse on the next battery. Um, the design that the Westmount Radio uses is from N8X JK. Uh, Dan uh, published an article in QST in 2004 um, on a kind of a unique idea for battery boosting. Uh, he doesn't use it, do the typical thing that uh, people do on the battery boosting. What he does is he takes the voltage that you have in the battery, figures out how much more you need, converts just that, and then adds it to the voltage at the end which substantially reduces the EMI. A lot of people like this. Uh, uh, Tim from TJ Electronics uh, they actually manufactured the unit, sold it for many years. Um, he passed away a couple of years ago and uh, we've made a deal with Dan to uh, take over the product. We remanufactured it to uh, uh, work with more surface mount parts to be smaller and to fit in more with our other product lines. So it's a uh, full 40 amps and uh, it still has the very low RFI. And instead of having multiple products, he had like a 25 amp, a 35 amp, you know, and all the way up. Um, we just have the 140 amp unit, but we designed it so that you can put them together in parallel. So you can make 80 amps, 120 amps very easily. Battery testing. Um, a two to 10 years on a battery, a lead acid battery, 64% um, of them die by age seven. Uh, they do like to be, kept cooler. So if they're cooler, they'll, they'll last longer. Um, in general, they say when you when the capacity of the battery drops about 20%, 85% um, of the battery life has already been exhausted. In other words, that's about the time to be buying a new battery. Two th big things that uh, cause a battery to die, uh, corrosion that we talked about earlier, and dry out. The dry out is, I remember I told you, it vents a little bit of gas, um, and it'll vent that gas when you're doing a high current discharge or a high current charge. Um, eventually, that gas has some acid in it. Eventually, there's not enough acid for the battery to operate properly. Um, I just talked about that. The two basic methods that you have to test the battery, um, this is what you get when you uh, drive into like a uh, automobile shop. You do a very quick test with a, uh, put a big load on the battery and see what the voltage drop is. That essentially tells them the internal resistance of the battery. Um, and that, that covers many of the cases of a failed battery, but not all of them. The true capacity test, you actually have to drain the battery all the way down, go all the way down to the 10.5 volts and figure out how much energy was in the battery. Um, and here, are, here's the chart as to what's accurate and what's not. Um, on the true capacity uh, test, we can detect 100% of the time because we know exactly what the capacity of the battery is, and we can predict it's going to die soon about 95% of the time. The, uh, the way that the uh, auto people test it, it can detect about 75% of the failures, and it can predict about 57%. We're, so you can see I'm promoting the uh, true capacity type of testing, and that's because West Mountain Radio has a unit to actually do a true capacity test on a battery. It's called the CBA. It's kind of a fun unit. You plug it into your PC, put it on your battery, tell it how much you want to discharge, let it sit there overnight, and it'll tell you in the next morning how many amp hours were in the battery. You can test all kinds of batteries 
um, with this little thing. It's basically an electronic load. You just tell it what you want the load to be and it uh, goes off and it tells you what kind of energy came out. Uh, you can plot multiple tests on the same screen. A lot of customers will test their batteries every six months and they'll look at the same serial number battery and just see you know, how the thing is progressing over time and be able to figure out, oh, this is now suddenly something big has changed here. Um, probably time to get rid of the battery. Um, all of these charts that I showed you earlier, a lot of them were created with the CBA. Um, this 50, 30 second transmit, 30 second receive, all of that kind of stuff I was doing with the CBA. We've got all sorts of units. The popular one is a 150 watt unit that you see there, but it goes all the way up to 2000 watts. So you can, uh, you can do some really massive discharges if you want. And actually, I think we've sold some 8,000 watt systems as well, which is just the, you know, four, four 2000 watt systems put together. One other cool thing I wanted to mention about the CBA, we have another product called Power Check, which is essentially a amp meter uh, voltmeter, which has an internal log. You can log the, the current draw over time uh, going to a device, like for example, a drone or a plane, and then put that into a CSV file on your PC and play it back through the CBA. The CBA will actually emulate the exact same discharge path um, on the battery. So if you wanted to find out what brand battery works best for the kind of application that you've got, uh, you can record the application and then on the bench test as many batteries as you want. It's really kind of a neat uh, feature in our CBA. And talk a little bit about uninterruptible power supplies. A uh, super popular product for West Mountain Radio has been the uh, PowerGate PG40S. Um, essentially, you've got uh, two diodes there that uh, control whether it's getting current from a battery or from a power supply, whichever is higher voltage will go uh, the current to the uh, transceiver. There's also a charger built in, which will charge the battery as long as you've got AC. So this is a, a nice setup. The switches from uh, when you're, you lose your AC, it switches the battery without even blinking on the radio. And you've got the nice charging that's sitting there, keeping the battery charged up, waiting for something bad to happen. A lot of customers ask us, can I, can I use multiple batteries? Um, you can if they're the same type and the same age. Um, I recommend that periodically you disconnect one of those straps between the batteries and just make sure there's not current flow between the two batteries. Uh, less than uh, you know 150 uh, milliamps is probably fine. Uh, but what you don't want is you don't want a good battery spending its whole life charging a bad battery or trying to charge it that will just cause additional heat and eventually trouble. Solar panel, I've got some sizes here, just so you have a, uh, an idea. 100 watt is probably a good size. Uh, 200 watts also not bad for amateur radio use. Um, <clears throat> this just gives you an idea of the sizes of the panels. You search on Amazon, it's a different deal every, every few months um, as to who's got the good deals. Um, can find something around a dollar per watt. If you've got a fancy stand or a fold up case or whatever, then the price may go up to about $2 a watt. I took the CBA. The CBA has a feature where it'll sweep current. In other words, it starts at zero amps, goes to you know 0 0.1 amps, goes to 0.2 amps, and just goes all the way up uh, to find out how much uh, voltage and current it can get out of, I'm sorry, how much voltage it can get out of the panel. And in this chart here, I've multiplied that voltage to show the number of watts. What you can see is solar panels actually have a sweet spot. This one's like somewhere around four amps. I'm getting over 65 watts out of the panel. But if I'm drawing less than that, I'm not getting the same wattage out. So if you wanna get the total amount of energy out of a panel, you wanna draw just the exact right amount of current from the panel. And I'll talk about that in a little bit as to how you do that. Um, this is that same chart, but if you look very carefully in the lower left corner, there's another little chart there. Um, what I've done is for the big one, the tall one, the 65 watt kind of one, this uh, panel was pointed at the sun. And for that little one in the corner there, the panel was just pointed in the bright sky, but not the sun. So, Pointing your solar panels at the sun can be very important. 
and the sun does move. The, this is showing how you can use that PG40S with a solar panel. Uh, what you want is something called an MPPT charge controller. The MPPT charge controller finds the sweet spot um, where that uh, high, high wattage is coming out of it, and the current draw, and then it converts that to whatever voltage it needs to charge the battery. Um, so it's ba basically a battery charger for solar panels, and it's generally okay to connect battery chargers in parallel. They figure, they figure things out. So you can have that MPPT controller connected in parallel with the PG40S. If you have a wall supply, it works. If you don't, it doesn't. Um, it takes it off of the charge controller. What you don't want to do is you don't want to plug that charge controller into where you would plug the power supply into, because then you would have two battery chargers in, in series, and you, that will not work. Battery chargers in parallel are okay, and series not so much. This is a, a new power gate that West Mountain Radio has come out. I said new, I think it's been out for more than three years now. Um, this actually has a solar panel input, not to the charge controller, because the charge controller is built into the Epic power gate, but uh, you go directly to the panel and it'll take care of the MPPT charge controlling inside the Epic. Um, it also has the traditional power supply input and battery uh, and transceiver output, of course. But those diodes that are shown on the screen are not really diodes, they are FETs. So the voltage drop is very low. It's about a 50 millivolt drop maximum um, from your power supply to your radio. So this will reduce substantially the voltage drop that you would have, have. And we talked earlier about how important that is to consider as far as how much transmit time you're going to get out of a, out of a radio. So this epic power gate is really cool. Um, a lot of neat features in it. What I've got here is a diagram of, uh, this is a, a base station setup. I just want to kind of show off some of the other West Mountain radio products. Um, we talked a little bit about the power check there in the uh, the upper left. Um, it, this is a good spot for it between like an Epic and a battery. The power check, remember, it, it has an internal log, so it can you know it can log for weeks worth of data, and then you can download it to a PC through a USB port, or you can watch it live on the PC through the USB port. Um, so you can see the battery charging, the battery discharging. You can see how you use it, how much energy is going both directions. Power check is bi-directional. It measures on the high side, so it's good for uh, vehicle use. Uh, a lot of other uh, uh, measurement devices like this, so uh, measure on the low side. Um, down below the Epic there, which is kind of the center of this, um, we have a Power Guard uh, product. Uh, the Power Guard Plus is uh, basically it's an electronic switch. It, uh, it's a solid state switch, not a relay. If the voltage gets too high or too low, it uh, disconnects it from your equipment to save your equipment. You can also connect up like a key switch or some, some other kind of a trigger uh, to, to activate that uh, or deactivate that uh, solid state switch. And, you know, you could have something in your basement, for example, if it detects water to just shut, the, shut everything down. Um, so that's kind of a neat, uh, a neat device. Down below are the rig runners. Most of you are probably familiar with the rig runners. They're very popular. We've got a lot of different styles, a lot of different uh, models. The basic purpose is just to distribute DC power to multiple devices. Um, we've got uh, EMI uh, protection in there to prevent uh, RFI from getting from one device to the other, and uh, every uh, line is fused separately. Uh, I just talked about the PowerGuard Plus. Forgot that I had a slide here on that. Um, it's really just a simple device. Uh, it just cuts the power off if it's too high or too low. The red light tells us yeah, it's too high, the yellow light too low. Um, and uh, there's also a USB port in this thing as well. We're putting USB ports in everything now, um, which will allow you to actually set the trigger, the trigger levels as to what, uh, what voltage you want to cut out at, what voltage, uh, uh, how long you want to wait for the voltage, if it's over voltage, uh, all sorts of parameters like that. Um, and this power guard, I can't, uh, po I'm sorry, power check plus, um, this internal log, it's really great. This is the kind of thing you can just plug in, again, power pole connectors on everything. Um, just plug it in line and it'll just monitor everything, tell you what your voltages were. It's good for up to 60 volts and up to 40 amps. Uh, this is a uh, typical field situation. Again, it, the power gates are good um, for that. 
power check again. Um, this, you could use a solar panel out in the field. In the lower left there, we've got a picture of some battery boxes. We put practically any combination of stuff that you would want on uh, battery boxes to kind of all ready to go. Just pick the thing up from your base station, go out into the field and start, continue to use it. Um, there's a section on our website where you can actually build your own box and just ask you what kinds of stuff do you want on it and tell you what the price is at the end. You can decide if that's something you want to go with or not. We use the regular car battery boxes like you would see in the marine application uh, for the uh, car size batteries, the group 24 batteries. But the new lithium batteries, we're using essentially ammo boxes and that's that uh, greenish boxes shown there in the foreground. Are there any questions? I might have a question. Okay. My name is Jeff, W3JEF. Um, I have a, I, I've asked this question of somebody before about battery. I have a handheld and I keep it in a rapid charger. Um, there's, there's no harm in keeping your radio on and keeping it in the rapid charger and you can use it all the time, is there? Generally not. Um, when the, when the lithium batteries came out and they started catching fire and stuff, there were a lot of the manufacturers were saying, well, you're overcharging it, take it off the charger when it's done charging. And you still see that vice today, but they've pretty much proven that it's not the chargers that's causing the trouble on these batteries. Um, so, and most of the chargers anyway, have the smarts in them. They know not to overcharge. If it's a lithium battery, they know that to shut the thing off. Um, mm -hmm. If it's a lead acid type battery, they know to, uh, you know, keep it trickled. So that, yeah, there, in general, there's, there's no harm uh, because it should know what it is. As long as you're using the, the right type of battery and the right type of charger, the charger should know exactly what it's doing. All of these chargers and microcontrollers in them now. So they know when to cut off the voltage and when not to. Got it. Um, what is a good uh, voltage range for the, uh, the wet batteries? Uh, like I have a, and I've always asked this too, I have a, I have a big motor home and I have huge batteries in this thing. And, uh, it, you know, I use the, the power inside, DC power inside. And, uh, of course, I'm also on an inverter. And I've always wondered, what's, what's a good healthy charge on batteries? 13.2? Um, it, it's going to depend a little bit on room temperature, but uh, usually 13.8 volts is what they recommend around room temperature. Um, if you're really interested, if you send me an email, my uh, email address is on the slide here. Um, I can send you a... Uh, a typical uh, detailed manual for, for uh, lead acid battery that will give you a whole chart on what temperature and what voltage and so on and so forth for charging it. So if you're interested in that kind of thing, uh, send me an email and I'll, uh, I'll give you a PDF uh, with all that information. Yeah, because in the winter time, I put it up for storage and I keep it on a trickle charger all winter. That, that, that's what you should do. Um, but if it, if, it, if it is in a cold, cooler environment, then they probably have a little bit different voltage that they recommend. They even recommend for charging that you change the voltage depending on the charging. Um, you know, they say in order to get the full number of amp hours on the battery, you actually have to have the right voltage for whatever temperature the room is that you're charging it in. Um, and we actually have that feature on our Epic power gate. You can put a, uh, there's a little plug-in uh, thermistor with a magnet on the end that you can stick on the side of the battery and it will actually change the charging voltage depending on the uh, on the temperature. I I don't really know have any experience as to how much that really makes a difference, but the battery manufacturers definitely uh, uh, will bring that up to you anytime you mention that you're not getting the right amp hours out of your battery. Yeah, because I'm in cold storage for it for the winter, and it it gets cold. I mean, when it down below zero, um, you know, I don't know what those batteries are running at, but. They're on trickle charge, and I'm expecting them in the spring. I'm going to hop in that and start that thing right up. So, yeah, uh, yeah. Drop me an email, and I'll uh, I'll send you off a PDF that's got the whole chart in it of, of the data. So, what am I what am I asking for? Requesting? Uh, just ask for some uh, some details on the battery uh, on battery charging. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mark, this this may be off topic from what you covered, but for when an alkaline battery leaks, is there any particular chemical or technique that seems to help? <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> I 
sure makes a mess. Um, oh, no, oh, I don't it's heartbreaking. Any, <laughs> I, I don't have any good advice on that. I usually use uh, the alcohols that they, uh, the technicians use for cleaning contacts, uh, trichloroethylene or just uh, regular household alcohol. Um, but I wouldn't say that I've had tremendous success. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. messy stuff. Yes, I understand. I, I, I lost a nice old handheld from the 60s that way. And, and um, along with the comments, oh, okay, I just got a, Ken Jones just said, use white vinegar, it, it neutralizes the base. Okay, that's the next thing I will try. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> and I, I have to agree with the earlier comment. If if a battery is left outside all winter, like a motorcycle battery that's kept in the garage, it will be dead in the spring. <laughs> yeah. Hey. All, you always want, in regardless of whether it's cold or hot, you always want to try and keep some sort of voltage on those batteries. So don't let acid batteries to prevent them from corroding. Is it a necessity on a wet battery that you use uh, distilled water to to fill it, refill? That's what they say. Again, I don't have good experience to say yay or nay. Yeah. I know. Uh, it, it's it's tough to keep those in maintenance. And it seems like they always need water, and I've always used the distilled water on the ones that that are wet. But uh, yeah, uh, I only do it because that's what the manufacturers say. Yeah, and I'm I have a maintenance check that I do it once a month, anyways, when I'm on the road and I'm out in the uh, out in the desert heat in Arizona and in those uh, places out there in California uh, because they do evaporate. Yeah, it's tough. It's kind of annoying because it seems to be evaporated just the time you need it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And once it gets below those cells, if you if you ignore it, it doesn't take much uh, much time for that for that to just begin to destroy itself. Yep. Yeah, the sealed batteries are great. Yeah. Um, I should point out that uh, we've got our booth open this weekend through Tuesday where we've got special deals. If you go to the slash show on our website, uh, there's like 10% off a lot of our products. Um, so feel free to go and avail yourself of that stuff over the next, uh, looks like four days. And also if you want a copy of all these slides and charts, there's a link there as well to, to download the slides. Somebody needs to mute. Echoed another high-profile exit from the Duvalde administration last year. <laughs> I do. Have a I question. got him. Nice. Uh, Tom uh, W1TP here. You uh, said with a dual with a parallel lead acid batteries, it's good to disconnect them and uh, measure whether one is feeding into the other. Is there some um, cutoff point at which you would do something about that? And if so, what? You charge one battery that's uh, more than the other, or how would you handle it? Um, I would remove them from the parallel situation. If And, you know, different people are going to have different thresholds of pain. My, my experience is uh, usually if they're the same type and the same age, and both batteries have been charged, um, you're usually seeing, you know, like on the order of 50 to 100 milliamps of, of flow. Um, that's just the differences in the batteries themselves. But uh, I would say if it goes over 150, I'd start to be more concerned because it's probably going to start growing more quickly. Uh, you just don't want enough energy that's actually going to start generating heat in one of the batteries or the other battery. And you also don't want to, you know, uh, uh, decrease the lifetime of your good battery. So I would say at that point, I would remove it. And I, I don't know I, that I'd call it a bad battery necessarily, but definitely it's different enough that uh, you probably don't want it in that parallel situation anymore. Thanks. Just a little note for my, uh, for my connections on uh, lead acid batteries. Again, I'm, I talk about my, my motor home with the big, huge batteries that I have. Uh, no ox on all those connections that you're, you solve all your problems with corrosion. <laughs> it's I have a, a question. It, Regarding your safety device, I forget the name of it. What kind of insertion loss does that have? How much um, is there, you know? I believe the FET is 0 0.07 ohms. Um, so it's very low. Uh, Actually, the most insertion loss, I think, comes from the fuse, and I don't remember exactly what that is. Um, 
but uh, it's not too much to be concerned about, that's for sure. Thank you. Are we good on questions? I'd just like to say that you really know your stuff. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. <laughs> you know, we get a lot of people who call with questions. And by the way, if you think of something, feel free to email or call in. Um, but yeah, we've done a lot. <laughs> so it's all from experience. Okay. Any, anybody else? Thank you very much, Mark. All yeah, right. Thank, thank you guys you. for having me. Thank, thank you, you, Mark. Really thank appreciate you, Mark. it. Great, great talk. And uh, boy, we had a lot of people here excited in this. And I want to remind everyone, we have an evaluation page on the main page of HamCon. Uh, be sure sometime during the day to, to rate this forum as well as some of the others you've been to. That kind of tells us what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong. Um, you know, it's a, it's a learning experience for everyone. Mark, thank you very much. Uh, if, if you'd like, uh, if, you, if you're around, uh, join us at 4 o'clock uh, Eastern at 3 o'clock uh, your time. We're going to have uh, ask the experts in case someone <laughs> comes up with a battery question. If you're not there, we'll, we'll try, <laughs> we'll, we'll have our local experts try and answer it. Uh, at least we know the one about the white vinegar to get rid of the, uh, the, uh, <laughs> sure. the paste now. All right. Thank you guys. Thank you.